Good morning. Welcome to the Technopreneurship class. To get us started, I'm going to give you a short pop quiz about technopreneurs and their startups. So I'm going to give you two hints. The first hint being harder than the second. So are you guys ready? Okay, for our first startup, the co-founders had not done a startup before, so this was their first. And they didn't have any money to do it. So any guesses? This is really hard, so I don't blame you if you can't guess it at, that, at this point. The second hint should be a bit uh, more helpful. The first co-founder is called the Uber Geek, and the second co-founder is called uh, is known as the Uber Salesman. Any guesses? If you guessed Apple, you're right. And it was founded by the two Steves. Steve Wozniak is the Uber Geek, and Steve Jobs is the Uber Salesman. Now let's move on to our second startup. So it was founded by a fresh college grad, much like you guys, and a hedge fund manager. So their first product was a cryptography software, so they wanted to sell this, this software to customers. Any guesses? So obviously the cryptography software business didn't work out too well, so these guys tried to use the same technology to wire money from one Palm Pilot to another. And this, a Palm Pilot, in case you don't know, was the precursor of today's smartphones. So any guesses? If you guessed PayPal, you're correct. So eventually, the Palm Pilot money transfer technology didn't work either. So they had to switch to what we now know as uh, the service that PayPal currently offers. Okay, so how are you guys doing so far? Let's do our third startup, and here's the first hint. They initially tried to sell computer hardware for visualizing CAT scans and uh, MRIs. And obviously that wasn't doing too well, so they tried to sell the company, and they only got one interested buyer, and that buyer offered only $5 million for that company. Now imagine this company already had dozens of people in it, yet its value was, was only $5 million. Any guesses? Here's a second hint. So obviously the, the hardware business wasn't doing too well, so what they did was to make animated films uh, for TV advertisements so that they can use those advertisements to sell the, the hardware. Any guesses now? If you guess Pixar, you're correct. And guess who was the guy that paid $5 million for Pixar? You're right, it was the guy who co-founded Apple, Steve Jobs. Okay, so let's move closer to home. The next co-founder uh, graduated from Ateneo, the kapitbahay natin, across from uh, Katipunan. Uh, that was in 1998. That was the worst time to graduate because it was hard to find jobs. And he eventually had to settle for a job at uh, KFC as an assistant manager. So any guesses? All right. Eventually, he moved out of that job and founded a company to develop digital products. Okay, with only just over 60K in capital. And just last year, that company had an IPO at the Philippine Stock Exchange with a market cap of 6.8 billion. So, any guesses who this guy is? If you guessed Nick Snulledo, that's him right there in the middle along with his uh, co-founders. And right there at the bottom is him uh, during the initial public offering at the Philippine Stock Exchange. And the company that he founded is Surpass. Okay, so now let's move even closer to home. Karina Ateneo, ito naman UP. Uh, and this is a husband and wife team, Isosceles and Leonora. If you have kids, don't name your son Isosceles. So much like yourselves, they started with their thesis, uh, and that was the first product of their startup. Any guesses? So now this company has actually come full circle, and they were one of the major licensees of UP technology, in particular, the Lagundi technology, which eventually was sold in the market as ASCOF. Any guesses? 
Okay, that's right. This is Pasqual Laboratory and uh, that's Mr. Isosceles and that's his uh, lovely wife, Leonora. So I hope you got some insights from our pop quiz. In this course, you're going to learn that technopreneurship is substantially different from what you may have normally learned from doing feasibility studies or, or normal corporate business planning. In one sense, it's not so much like shock and awe, army and navy warfare, as much as it is about guerrilla warfare. Entrepreneurship in that sense is being able to pursue an opportunity even if you don't have any resources to begin with. In this course, you're also going to learn the biggest reason that startups fail and how you can minimize that failure. And there's only one reason, according to Steve Blank, Steve Blank, the technopreneurship professor from Stanford, who says that startups fail because you don't talk to customers. So in order to reduce the chance of failure, you have to get out of the building and talk to your customers. Because you cannot have a successful startup, you cannot launch an innovation until you find that intersection between what customers need and what solutions you can provide. So the first question you're probably going to ask yourself is, can I do this? Do I have what it takes? Now, a survey was made by TechCrunch, one of the leading online magazines on technopreneurship in Silicon Valley. And they surveyed a bunch of technopreneurs, successful technopreneurs, and they asked them, were you interested in becoming an entrepreneur when you were in college? And if you look at this slide, a good one-third of them didn't even think about becoming an, an entrepreneur. And one-fourth were just somewhat interested in becoming an entrepreneur. You might also think that entrepreneurs are born and, and not made. And usually, they come from a long line of entrepreneurs in their family. But again, in the same survey, they were asked if they were the first in their family to do it. And the good half of those uh, founders were the first in their family to do a startup. And you might be familiar with these names, guys like Bill Gates from Microsoft, Jeff Bezos from Amazon, and then the two guys, uh, Paige and Bryn from, from Google. So obviously a majority of these guys had to learn how to be an entrepreneur. So how do we do that? Here's the first principle of this course. And uh, what I'm going to tell you is from research by a psychologist from the University of Florida, Anders Ericsson, uh, in this book, uh, Talent is Overrated. So one of the interesting research that they did went like this. So I'm going to flash this chessboard to you so you guys take a look at it. Okay? And then I'm going to remove it. And then I'm going to ask you to recall how many pieces there were, what kind of pieces, and where they were located on the chessboard. Okay? So how did you guys do? Well, what he did was to actually show this same chessboard to two kinds of people. Ordinary people like, like you and me, and also to chess grandmasters. You can imagine which group of people was able to memorize more of the pieces. And if you would say that chess grandmasters were able to memorize more of the pieces, you'd be correct. However, that's not the interesting result from the study. This chessboard is actually from an actual game. I think it was from one of the, the, the final games between Karpov and Kasparov. So this is an actual configuration of chess pieces that you would get from a game. And so the interesting second part of the experiment was when they had the same pieces, but it was completely random. And again, they showed the same chessboard to both the grandmasters and regular people. So given that new configuration, given those new conditions, which group of people do you think did better? The interesting result was they were practically the same. In other words, normal people performed almost as good as the chess grandmasters. So in other words, it wasn't a matter of the chess grandmasters having special neurons or, or better brains that would explain the difference in the result 
in the first experiment as opposed to the result in the second experiment where the grandmasters and the regular people did the same. So what accounts for the difference? So the only thing that could explain the difference between the performance of the grandmasters and ordinary people is the specialized intense training that they underwent. And you might have heard of the 10,000 hours principle. And in a related study, they counted, they profiled the number of hours that the best violinists or musicians did practice and the next best. And it turns out that the top performers in their field have gone through 10,000 hours of practice and the next best may have gone say only 7,000 or so hours and then the third best would maybe just have gone through 3,000 hours. So it's practice that makes perfect. But then you might ask, okay, um, you have for example professors like myself that have been teaching for over a decade. So let's put this 10,000 hours figure in perspective. If you say do 1,000 hours a year for 10 years, so 1,000 hours a year would translate to about 3 hours a day for maybe 300 days a year. So if you do 3 hours a day, every day for 10 years, then do you become world class? Obviously not. Or you have other professionals that have been at their jobs for more than 10 years, but they're not world class. So in other words, it's not just any kind of practice that makes you world class. It's a specific kind of practice called deliberate practice. And there are three components of deliberate practice. One is that you have to set goals. It has to become increasingly harder. Okay, much like when you're doing bodybuilding, you start with say 10 pounds and three weeks from now, you go from 10 pounds to 15 pounds. And over time, you build up uh, capacity. So that's the first component of deliberate practice. The second is that there's no shortcut. It's hard work. It's mentally draining and it's no fun, but that's what you need to build skill. And then finally, you need a coach or a mentor to provide continuous feedback. But in cases where you can't find a coach or a mentor, then you have to figure out what you're doing wrong and then to correct them and improve your performance. So why should I go through with it? We apply these same principles to anything that involves the human brain. Apply deliberate practice, 10,000 hours. You're not just gonna be best in UP, best in the Philippines, but best in the world. And that includes everything from music, to art, to R&D, and of course, to entrepreneurship. That's the first principle in this course. It's deliberate practice. At this point, you might be thinking, Teka, saan ang hirap naman yan? 10,000 hours. Why should I go through all that pain? Okay, what will motivate me to stick through all of the challenges you know, until you know, I, get, I get to be world class? To, to illustrate that principle, I'm going to tell you a story. You, know? you may have heard this story before. So this CEO of a company was going to go on vacation, uh, pupunta siyang Bali. And then he summons his three vice presidents. So the first vice president, he gave 5 million pesos to invest. The second one, he gave 3 million pesos. And the third, he gave 1 million pesos. And then he goes on his vacation. Okay? So yung, yung first vice president, he got 5 million pesos. Uh, Major e-commerce yung, yung gusto niyang gawin. So starts an online business and then makes another 5 million pesos. Uh, the second vice president, major social enterprise, ang the niya, no? so he was able to use that three million to build houses and then raise another three million to build more houses, uh, and so on. Third vice president, he takes the money and then buries it. So you guys haven't heard this story before. If, if you guys uh, went to Bible school, this is actually the parable of the talents. And maybe the moral of the story when we, were in, uh, when we were in Sunday school was that oh, we should share our talents, we shouldn't hide them. No? But uh, for us, for this class, I'm interested in another lesson. And we can understand that lesson by asking a question, not 
what they did, but why they did it. So what do you think? Why did the first two start their ventures and why did the third guy just bury it? What do you think? So it is the fear of losing. It is the fear of failure that kept him from achieving what the first two guys did. And the same question was actually asked by another psychologist, originally from Colombia, and then she eventually went to, to Harvard. And the first time she asked this question was with, with school kids, students, much like yourselves. So she was asking them, what makes one child ready to take on challenges and another child, you know, exactly the same challenge, they will shy away from them. No? And she realized that there are actually two kinds of mindsets. So the kids will have two kinds of mindsets. One is the fixed mindset, and, and that is the belief that what you have right now, that's, that's it, okay? If you're bad, you're bad at something. If you're good, then you're good at something. Uh, the problem is, if you're bad at something and you have this fixed mindset, then you're not gonna exert any effort to improve. And that also works for the opposite example. If you're good at something, but you have the fixed mindset, it's also bad because you don't want to take on any new challenges because you know, you're supposed to be smart, right? And then you have a new teacher, suddenly gives a very hard exam and then you start failing, then you, know, you start blaming the teacher. Maybe the teacher is not so good, right? <laughs> and you will lose interest, okay? Now the opposite of the fixed mindset is, is the growth mindset and that is there is absolutely no limit to what the human brain can achieve. So there may be, for example, stuff that's limited by genetics, such as maybe your height or your, or your body build or the way you look. But in the growth mindset, anything, any skill that involves the human brain, whether it's music, art, science, engineering, business, and even entrepreneurship, you know, these all involve the human brain. This can be cultivated through effort. And there is no upper limit to what you can achieve if you apply the principles of deliberate practice. The interesting work from, from Carol Dweck is that not only does the kind of mindset you have determine how you perform, but more importantly, you can change mindsets. She was successful in, in getting students to shift from a fixed mindset to the growth mindset, and in so doing, suddenly improve their performance just by the shift in the mindset alone. Okay? Because under the same conditions, under the same environment, the same challenges, the same circumstances, the mindset that you have is the filter by which you perceive the world and how you react to it. So when you have a fixed mindset, when you have a challenge, you tend to avoid the challenge, but when you have a growth mindset, you tend to embrace the challenge. Effort is the same thing. No? Um, in school, in college, you have a classmate, Exam the next day, magi inuman siya the night before, so bangag siya the next morning, and then he still aces the exam. And then idol, wow, di ba? You know? <laughs> so, but that's, that's exactly the fixed mindset uh, at work. Yun yung mga tao na ina idolize natin, but that's the fixed mindset. And then pag yung tentawag natin na nag effort, in effort tan yung pag-aaral, yung pa yung, uy, sobra naman yun. OA, nag effort. Yung pa yung tinitira natin, no? but that's, what Carol Dweck is saying, those are the, the people that are demonstrating the growth mindset. And over time, those are the guys that will succeed. Okay? So effort in the fixed mindset is either fruitless or not necessary. And in the growth mindset, it's the essential part to the mastery. And finally, and this is the most important for this class, no? when you have the fixed mindset, when you encounter criticism, you either ignore it or you're even resentful of criticism, we take it personally. But when you have the growth mindset, it's the critical part of deliberate practice. You remember the third component of deliberate practice is? Feedback. feedback. And feedback, criticism is just feedback in another form. So criticism is important in a growth mindset, but it is anathema in the fixed mindset. Okay? So that's the second principle that uh, I want you guys to take away from, from this class. With those two principles, let's now look at how we're going to bring innovation to the market. 
in general, in this class, when, when we look at innovation, when we look at doing a startup, you're generally faced two kinds of risk. Number one is technical risk. This is what we have been teaching you in, in engineering, is how to manage the technical risk, and that's making the product work. But in this class, we'll also learn about market risk, and, and that is the customer may not want your, your product. So how do we then efficiently and with minimal risk uh, bring innovation into the market? Now, there are many ways to do it, as you can imagine. And the traditional way of doing, of launching an innovation is the linear process. This is known by the stage gate process. And in this process, we start with the idea, we scope it out, uh, we, we build, do a business plan, maybe do preliminary development, test it, evaluate the, the first prototype, test it again, and then when it passes, then we go and launch that to the market. And this is fine. I'm not saying this is a bad approach. And a lot of innovation gets launched this way. So if you have mature technologies like the construction industry, you can they build skyscrapers using this exact same technique. So obviously that works, right? However, there are two conditions under which it fails. Number one, if you're entering a new market or you're, or you're trying to launch a new technology, and the second is when you yourself is doing it uh, for the first time. For any of those two conditions, there is uncertainty. And in those two cases, the additional linear approach doesn't work very well. So what do we then do? No? Now, the alternative was originally proposed by two business school professors, uh, McGrath and, and Macmillan, and uh, that was the basis of discovery-driven planning. Steve Blank from Stanford took that and developed the, a process known as customer development. And Eric Ries popularized that into what is now known as the Lean Startup approach. So to help illustrate the principle of the Lean Startup, and this is from Steve Blank of Stanford. So one day, a couple of graduate students, or a couple of students, engineering students approached him and said, okay, we want to do a startup on smart farming. Okay, so they said, uh, we want to buy a drone, you know those drones that, that fly around, let's buy a hyperspectral camera, let's buy and build software for image processing and then spend nine months working on it and then, then we'll launch the startup. And then Steve Blank said, no, that's not the way to do it. That's a very risky move. So what's a better way to do it? What did Steve Blank advise the students? What do you think? Well, to help you answer that question, here are three issues, here are three things well, I want you to think about. Number one, who is the customer in this case? Okay, the farmers, right? Okay, so that's the customer. They're the guys who are gonna pay for this product. Number two, why should they pay for it? Why would a farmer pay for this product? If there will be increase in productivity, so why, why will that matter? If the amount they will pay you as a startup yeah, will be less than the amount that they will earn maybe in either increased profits or in, in lower costs. So that's the value proposition, right? And, and how will this technology deliver on that value proposition? So what, so what if you have a drone? How will, how will it increase the productivity of the farm? What do you think the issues, other than harvesting, what are the issues that a farmer faces? Uh, pest infestation. So if we can monitor pest infestation, then, and if maybe there's more pests in one area than the other, then we don't have to spray the whole farm equal amounts of pesticide. We can just put enough pesticide here and then uh, appropriate to the amount of, of pests. So in effect, that's going to be reducing your costs. Another way is, for example, irrigation. You could, if you monitor moisture in the soil, if you could figure out a way to monitor that from the, from the air, then you can also reduce your cost of, of irrigation. And the same thing goes for fertilizers. So that could be the value proposition of, of this product. So that's a, that answers the second question. Given that value proposition, how then, what is the most efficient way of proving that? terms of least cost and least time. 
this is what actually Steve Blank advised his students. Instead of you know, buying a UAV and spending six months developing software and then buying also the camera, he says, why don't we just get the data somewhere else, process that data by hand, okay, and then show that data to the farmer. Mr. Farmer, you know, we, this is the data that tells us, okay, you, you can reduce your irrigation by this much, you can reduce your pesticides by this much. And with this information, would you not be willing to pay? And would that also help you become more productive in your farm? And you can do that with, in far less time and with far less money than the original approach by the student. Does that make sense? And that is the heart of the lean startup process. You start with assumptions, and then based on those assumptions, you build something that will quickly validate those assumptions or invalidate them. And then you, you get feedback from your market, get feedback from your users, and then you repeat the cycle. So that's what we're going to do in this class. And not only are you going to do it once, you're going to do it at least three times. So there's going to be at least three feedback cycles by the time we're done in this class. With the final feedback cycle, the results you're going to present on demo day. And this is what differentiates this class from your normal thesis or dissertation class. This is not just about building product, this is about reducing both technical and market risk. So you have to go through these cycles with your customer. And that's our key output for this course, is to do market validation. So that's what you're going to go through in this course, essentially, is to first identify an opportunity from among dozens of possible opportunities, and then to do market validation on that opportunity. For those of you who want to go beyond the class and have a very promising venture, then that's where the rest of the startup ecosystem in, in the campus is going to help you. Now, this course, we have not just you guys, not just the students uh, enrolled in, in this class, but uh, we may also be joined by, by other students not just from engineering, but from other uh, colleges as well, and even from outside. You may even be working with other startups on, on, on campus. And we even have uh, student orgs like Upstart um, that uh, can uh, join your team. If you do decide, and you're not required to, by the way, you're not required to launch your startup in this class, but if you are excited about turning your idea from just a plan, just a, a pitch deck uh, into, into something real, then one of the organizations that will help you uh, there is, is Enterprise and we provide mentoring, workspaces, uh, staff support and uh, some seed funding courtesy of our uh, industry sponsors and support in working with other laboratories and other resources on, on campus. Enterprise is just one of four uh, components in the ecosystem. So there's three other incubators, one in the corner of Katipunan and CP Garcia, and uh, there's another one also along CP Garcia next to ASTI. And there's one, you've been to a Techno Hub along Commonwealth. There is, there's 10 buildings there, the middle building where the restaurants are, it's horseshoe shaped. On the right side in the second floor, it actually hosts a couple of uh, startups as well. That's the ecosystem uh, support on, on campus. and. Among those four institutions, there are, uh, I think, at least three or four dozen startups that are currently in or have been uh, launched uh, in those uh, incubators, including eight from uh, Enterprise uh, itself. So we're especially proud of our first two teams, uh, GS Metrics and Itemhound, because they were ERDT students, they were ERDT scholars, much like uh, yourselves, and they actually were working on their startup while they were doing graduate school. And not only that, they also finished their, uh, their graduate degree. Helping us uh, with our teams are 11 senior partners, including uh, Gary Villame of, uh, of Item Hound. You may recognize some of these names or some of the startups uh, uh, that they founded, and they're here to help startups with all of their experience and all of their uh, uh, network to, to help launch our technology startups here on, here on campus. Okay, so you may be wondering at this point, Sir, I'm not going to start up. I'm not going to start up. I'm not going to start up. 
Okay. Well, um, this class would still be helpful because what we will teach you in this class are our skills like the customer development process, which would be useful even if you're working for a company because it could help you launch an innovation from within a company. We'll also do a lot of pitching. By the time Demo Day uh, is upon us, you'll have probably pitched to the class and, and to our, our panelists uh, at least uh, 10 times or so. We also teach you how to manage teams and projects uh, efficiently and also not just how to collaborate with each other as students but also with your, with your customers, with investors and so on. Now, this is probably the longest formal lecture you're going to hear from, from this course. Uh, this class is going to be taught not using the traditional lecture format but using the so-called inverted classroom format. So we expect you to be watching the videos before you come to class and the class is where we do seat work, where you guys pitch, where you guys discuss with your team, work on the deliverables in class and uh, myself and uh, other facilitators and resource persons will be around during class to advise you and, and, and guide you along the way. So all of the content, all of the materials, these lectures, readings, etc. It will be posted on uh, Ovle. If you guys uh, have a UP webmail account, you can just uh, go into uh, Ovle and log in. There's no, there's no password. Uh, if you don't have one, just send me an email at this address. We have a whole SEM to work with and it's roughly divided into four phases. We initially start with opportunity identification, that's generally the first month, and we'll have resource persons and speakers from industry uh, to give you inspiration. On the second part, once you start choosing and forming teams around the most promising ventures and technologies, then we start going into in-depth design, and this is what we call the low fidelity, minimum viable product. And then you'll go out to your customer and validate that. And then once you get good feedback from, from that, and you may need to iterate along the way, then you will we'll work out the other details of, of your business plan, and that includes addressing IP and tech transfer issues. Uh, we'll look at uh, distribution channels, we'll look at sales, we'll look at production, and we'll look at, we'll at cost. And then all of this information will be put together into what we call the high fidelity minimum viable product. And uh, then you go back to your customer and validate that again, and then you share the feedback from your customer to our panelists on, on Demo Day. And then that's it. That's the, that's the semester. Here's the schedule for the, for the class. The way we arrive at your grade is uh, each of these asterisks is 10 points. Uh, and then Demo Day at the end, that's uh, the last week, uh, will be worth 20 points. And then we just total that and then uh, we just prorate that to 100. Most of the class is group work. You have to learn how to work as a team. Uh, there's only four initial deliverables. That's the self-profile, the know-who, the know-how, and the one-day validation that is an individual grade. The rest of the deliverables are, are as a group. So since this is seat work, we expect the whole team, if you're part of a team already, we expect the whole team to be in the class. And if you're not there, then you don't get, you don't get the grade. Uh, as, as that group. Okay, by default, each deliverable is due online and I'll, I'll show you how to post the deliverables later, but they're due uh, two hours before the start of the, of the class so that I can download them and review them before we start the class. Just like uh, in business and just like in life, 80% uh, of success is uh, just showing up. And in fact, uh, if you pitch on demo day, that's already worth 60% of your demo day score just by showing up on demo day. The best teams, of course, will get 100%. Other policies in the class, since this is a lean startup class, we do encourage you to pivot as many times as is needed. Okay, so we're not going to make you suffer through an initially bad idea and say, okay, you have to finish that, even if you started out with a bad idea. You can always pivot to a better idea and may even reform, reform your team. So if an idea obviously is not working out, I'll ask you to defer that and maybe reform with another team and maybe start uh, a new idea. Just note that teams can pirate 
members, students from other teams. You can also fire members of your team that are not performing, get rid of them. And you can also recruit from outside the class, even those students and even graduates or professionals that are not, that are not enrolled. Uh, in other words, we want you to practice the same skills in class as though you were running an actual startup, short of actually launching the business itself. So this is like entrepreneurship in a sandbox. When you're in class and there might be people here, students here are not enrolled, that's okay. Uh, welcome to the class. Uh, but we have one main rule. Everyone who is here in this class has to participate. Okay, there is no such thing as an observer in this class. You're here, you join a team, you pitch a venture, you work on your venture. Otherwise, you're welcome to join us again. If you're not ready for that, you're welcome to join us again next semester. In addition to the self-profile, uh, you have two additional assignments and uh, the deadlines for these will be posted on Oble. The first one is called the know-who exercise, is to find a possible customer and then identify an innovation opportunity for that customer. So in other words, this is learning about the customer's problems and then based on your own areas of expertise, you want to propose a product or a service for, for that customer. So that's called the Know Who exercise. We have a database that where you can post your entry. And the second homework due a little bit uh, later is called the Know How uh, exercise. And that is to pick from one of the existing R&D going on in campus or maybe recently completed and then apply the same thinking that we did in the Steve Bland case study. So based on that technology, who do you think is the possible customer for that technology, number one? Number two, what does that technology have to offer to the customer? Why will they pay for that product or service? What is the value proposition in other words? There's a couple more uh, entries, but uh, that's explained in the board. So there's just a couple of uh, detailed tips here on, on this exercise. In the know-who exercise, do not use as much as possible your parents or, or siblings. Try to get somebody who is really independent. And then finally, a couple of weeks from now, I'm going to ask you to form teams. And this is a key principle of this class. You're not going to just form teams from among your friends or people you've, you've worked with. We want to form teams, just like in a real startup. We want to form teams based on the roles and skills that are needed to make the venture succeed. Uh, and in general, there are three kinds of profiles. Number one, you need the salesman, the connector, somebody who's going to talk to your customers. Number two, you need the technical expert. We call, them the, we call that the maven. Uh, and then they're the ones who may uh, develop the technical specs or even for those software ventures in the class who are going to prototype. The, the system. And then finally, we have the guy who's going to coordinate all of the work and make sure tasks are getting done, tasks are evenly distributed. So these are the three minimum roles. We'll talk a bit more about that in a, in a later session. But just bear in mind that we do have to form teams around these specific. So again, uh, in summary, uh, we have to keep the lines of communication open. Uh, read up on the materials in uh, Uvle and check in on our Facebook group. The link uh, will enroll you in the Facebook group. Converse with your teammates and with our, our resource person and panelists, build and then do the market validation. And at the end of the SEM, this is what we want you guys to happen. You make your pitch, the investors, the industry panelists, they like your technology, they're excited about their technology, they want it launched yesterday. So that's the, the intro. Uh, are you guys ready? Okay, then let's proceed. <laughs>